Today we are in week five of our series called Win in Romans, which means that after today we are a quarter of the way through it, guys. <laughs> Some people are like, oh man, can we just get through this already? No, this is really good. We're going verse by verse. We're going chapter by chapter through the book of Romans. It has a lot of truths that can, we can unpack and apply to our lives uh, in fact, I want to talk about something today. It's going to be great for those of you who are vets to the faith. This is going to be encouraging to you. To those who are maybe seekers or starters or returners, explorers to what it means to be to have faith in Jesus, this is going to be foundational for you. you. Everyone's going to get something out of today because it's going to be something as we go kind of go back into our kind of faith history. Now, I don't know about you. I haven't done the 23andMe. Anybody do like a DNA test like that? You guys are really fascinated with where you're from, your ancestry, your, your heritage. In fact, in my family, it's, 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 in my immediate family, it's pretty funny because Jen has more of a uh, desire to know about my family history than even I do. <laughs> she asks me questions all the time. I rarely have the answers. And she's like, you, you never asked your parents? You never asked your So she's asked, she'll ask my family sometimes. And then, then you know, and as I've gotten older, I've had a little bit more interest in kind of those things. But definitely, I was, I was kind of, it was early marriage and kind of growing up, like, I don't really know. I never really asked that. I didn't really have a, uh, I don't know. I don't know. I don't have a good reason. But, uh, and so I never could, did those things. But we do, I want to talk a little bit today about faith histories and traditions and just kind of a backstory of our, of our faith heritage. In fact, I would talk about commonality. We have more in common than we do, than what sets us apart. Now, you may have heard that before. You may have heard that in a lot of commercials or, you know, campaigns before. We have more that, uh, that keep that's in common than we do that sets us apart. It's more than a cliche. It's, it's, a, it's a cultural truth. And because all religious faith systems have histories. But most people are more interested in their personal faith experiences. Than their histories. I, that's my way with my kind of lineage. That's the way I was, was for a long time. I was like, I was more concerned with my personal experiences than I was with my family's history. Religious people are generally more concerned with getting God to answer their prayers than they are with the concept of a prayer answering God and wh- wh- how it came from originally. Like, if you thought about, like, this whole concept of a prayer-answering God is crazy. It's unbelievable. But we have that. And that's unfortunate because faith based on personal experiences alone eventually buckles under the weight of those personal experiences. In other words, if, you, if, you, if your faith is built on personal experiences alone, if the soon, as soon as something tragic happens in your life, what happens to your faith? It starts to like waver and shake a little bit. And perhaps that's your story. Perhaps that's your story about, about faith in general. Perhaps that's your story about how you've wrestled with coming to faith. Now the three major faith traditions, they all have the same starting point. There's a bit of overlap in, in how God views humanity in Christianity, in, in Judaism, in Islam, they kind of share some of the same starting points. They all agree that God created humanity in his image. They all agree that, that in the beginning, God and mankind lived in harmony. And they all agree that God gave humanity the capacity to say yes or no to their creator that they gave, we have free will. And they all teach that early in that history of humanity, somebody said no. That's when, when that happened, sin entered the world, right? And when sin entered the world, nothing that has been, has been, has been as good as it has intended or as it was intended to be. The cost of sin is death. And that's because humanity's relationship with God was broken. Sin ruptured the harmony that we have with God. And sin has been rupturing the harmony uh, that we have with God ever since. Ever since. The intro of sin into the human experience was, 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 was left God kind of with a choice. Left God with a choice. Either destroy the sin-infected world 
and start over or roll up his sleeves and work on fixing it. And since he doesn't break his promises and he, he decided he was going to wait in. When does one begin or where does one begin the task of restoring a world from the effects of sin? I don't know if you've ever done this, uh, but if you've ever like spilled a can, a gallon of paint all over your living room floor. Just imagine that. Some of you would be tempted to move right then and there. We got to get out of here. It's too much. I can't do it. I can't deal with it. If you, tempt, if you spilled a gallon of paint all over your living room floor, uh, you would have to start somewhere, right? You'd have to figure it out. You have to pick a starting point and begin cleaning. That's all you can do. I thought about doing that as an illustration here today, but I thought that'd be too messy. I'd get in trouble. You'd have to pick a place and just start cleaning up. And God did the same thing. But instead of starting at a particular place, he started with a particular man. Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, they all agree that God began the cleanup process with a man named Abraham. In Romans chapter 4, verse 1, it says this. It says, Abraham was, humanly speaking, the founder of our Jewish nation. What did he discover about being made right with God? Paul's asking this question. He's about to answer the question, and we're going to dig into it. But it, he says right there in, cha in chapter 4, verse 1, Abraham was, humanly speaking, the founder of our nation. The founder of our nation. But where, but where, what did he discover about being made right with God? There's something that he discovered. Now, the story of Abraham, the story of Abraham goes all the way back to like 1876 B.C. Long before Jesus, long before Muhammad, long before Moses and the Ten Commandments, Abraham was a man of wealth and influence. He had land, he had cattle, he had servants, but one thing he didn't have, a son. In Abraham's culture, Having a son, having an heir was a big deal. He would have traded everything he had just for one son. That's why when God told him to pack up everything he had and leave uh, everything he was familiar with, the country in which he had grown up, he did. And God's interaction with Abraham started with three promises. The first promise was this, I'm going to make you into a great nation. And that was a shock to Abraham. That came as a giant shock to Abraham because he was old. He was well, his wife was well beyond childbearing years. He, they had no kids. God didn't simply promise Abraham a child. He promised that he'd become an entire nation. That's exactly what happened. Israel, along with several Arab nations, actually claimed Abraham as its father. The second promise was this, I'm gonna, I will bless you and make your name great. I will make you well known. I'm going to make you famous. People are going to hear about you. And that happened as well. There have been many great achievers throughout history. There have been many people who have done amazing things. There have people who have gone and have been forgotten. But just about everyone has heard of this nomad named Abraham. And the third promise was this. All the peoples on the earth will be blessed because of you. All, all people on the earth. It's a big promise. Not only would they know his name, they would be blessed. They would be better off because of Abraham. Now you can imagine as Abraham hearing these three promises, being just like overwhelmed by this. And it would have been one thing if God had promised that the people of Abraham's nation would be blessed through him. But his promise was bigger than that. His promise was that every people group on the planet would somehow be better off because of Abraham, and that happened as well. Every Jewish person who has ever lived certainly is better off because of Abraham. Muslims hold Abraham in high regard. Christian, Christians from every generation believe they are better off because of Abraham. Promise fulfilled. But what did he discover about being made right with God? And to answer that, we first have to talk about rules. 
Let's talk about rules. How many rule enforcers do we have here? Rule enforcers. You love enforcing the law. Okay. How many rule benders do we have in here? Okay. A few more. Okay. Those are the last child of the family right there. Any first child rule followers, you know, that's me. When it comes to faith, the rules are most likely the thing that made you question whether faith or whether religion had a place for you or not. It's usually those are the things that you think about. Like, I'm not really sure I can really abide by that. People, uh, perhaps the rules associated with your faith tradition made you feel judged. Maybe a faith community may have even ostracized you. I don't know. It turned you off. Maybe it was around this idea of rules. The truth is, most religious rules are contrary to human uh, nature, and being the human that you are, that presents a problem. Inconsistency in the way that the rules are applied and to whom they are applied may have left you with the impression that religion breeds hypocrisy. That's why it's out there, and it's not untrue. It's, it's kind of true because people love loopholes. Many people like loopholes. I know you like loopholes, right? Because you're like, hey, I got this, this sticker price says this. This is all I'm paying. I found myself a loophole. We, we like finding loopholes, and everybody loves it. Matter, it's not religious people, not faith people. It's, just, it's all people. We all love loopholes when it benefits us. And religious people are no different. They aren't immune to loopholes. So we all look for them. We are generally better at believing than behaving. In spite of that, all faith systems agree that in order to be in good standing, in order to be right with God, and in order to be good standing, followers need to keep the rules. Right? Belief and behavior are central in every major religion. Every major religion. Obedience determines goodness. Rules define proper and improper behavior within a faith system. But here's something you may not have considered, and this is a big one. Rules always assume a relationship. Rules assume a relationship. If you're a parent, you set the rules for your kids, right? Imagine getting a call from a neighbor, checking in on your kids to see if they're in bed. Right? None of their business, right? right? They can't set the rules for your kids. They're your kids. You get to set. An individual's children are his or her kids, before the creation of rules, right? In fact, someone's children are their kids even if there aren't any rules. This is what we call the family model. The family model, relationship precedes rules. You have a relationship before there are any rules or if there are any rules, you still have a relationship. Now, the family model isn't the only model. In some cases, one's willingness to adopt or agree to a set of rules creates the relationship. Right? This is called the club model. When you join a gym, when you join a hunting club, when you join a country club, when you, whenever you join these things, you sign a contract agreeing to abide by the rules. Right? It's, and agreeing to the rules is how the relationship is established. It's the terms and conditions that none of us read. And in the club model, rules precede the relationship. And breaking the rules, breaking the rules can result in termination of that relationship. But in religion, in faith, which model reflects the connection between rules and relationship? When it comes to God, what, what model is it? Is it the family model where disobeying the rules will get you punished but not necessarily kicked out of the family? Right? Or is it the club model where you have to agree to the rules beforehand to get in, and if you don't keep the rules, you'll be asked to leave? Now, how you answer that question will determine the way that you view God and the way you assume he views you. Now, even though God made Abraham three promises, Abraham didn't know how things would turn out, so he did what we would do. He worried. He worried. 
Abraham and Sarah were still hoping for a son. Without a male heir, Abraham's chief servant, Eleazar, would inherit everything. That's just kind of how it went back then. And the writer of Genesis tells us that one evening, when, while Abraham was sharing these concerns with God, God spoke to him. And this is found in Genesis chapter 15. And it says this in verse 4. It says, The Lord said to him, your servant will not be your heir, for you will have a son of your own who will be your heir. You're going to have a son of your own. Then the Lord took Abraham outside and said to him, look up at the sky and count the stars if you can. That's how many descendants you will have. Big promise. God, Abraham is sharing concerns with God and And God is speaking to him, hey, I got you. Just look up. That's going to be who you, you know, your legacy. That's going to be you. It's an encouraging moment. But as encouraging as it may have sounded, it didn't change the fact that Abraham and Sarah were old and childless. Maybe you have come to grips with some of that in your own life where you're going, okay, God, I trust you. I believe, but, but this doesn't change my circumstance. That's encouraging and all, but let's go. So Abraham had to decide whether to believe that God would be able to keep this unbelievable promise. And Abraham's brief dilemma sets the stage for one of the most important statements found throughout all of Scripture we, it what followed was a declaration of, of, uh, and clarification concerning the starting point for humanity's relationship with God. It's found in Genesis 15, 6. It's the next verse. It says, Abram believed the Lord, and the Lord counted him righteous because of his faith. Abraham had to decide in that moment, am I going to believe God or not? It says, Abram believed the Lord. It was counted to him as right. In other words, righteousness was credited to or applied to Abraham because he believed God's promise. So in Romans chapter 4, back to our text, it says this. It says this about Abraham. If his good deeds had made him acceptable to God, he would have had something to boast about. But that's not God's way. For the scripture tells us Abraham believed God and God counted him as righteous because of his faith. Paul's quoting Genesis 15 here. He believed God when, because, of his, because of his faith. We see that, 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 that Abraham not only uh, believed God, he made the choice to do something in a moment that seemed kind of, you know, I don't know. I don't know how it's going to turn out, but I have to choose something. So I'm going to choose to believe God. Now, here's the deal. We associate righteousness or right standing with God a lot of times with good or perfect behavior. We do. So how could righteousness, how could righteousness be credited to or applied to Abraham? That's an important question because families have been divided and wars have been fought over that very question. What does it mean for righteousness to be credited to Abraham? To Abraham was given the same rights and privileges as a perfectly righteous person and that, 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 that they would gain through living a perfect life. Perfect acts of righteousness. Instead of earning a right standing with God, it was what they're talking about, he was given a right standing with God. It was gifted to him in response to faith. In fact, he goes on to say this. uh, He says, when people work, their wages are not a gift, but something they have earned. But, in verse 5, people are counted as righteous not because of their work, but because of their faith in God who forgives sinners. Paul is trying to illustrate to us that it goes beyond just what we can do. We can't earn our way to righteousness. And while we have a trouble kind of coming to grips with the, the web of relationship and rules and family model and club model and all these different things, and I have to be righteous and I have to earn, Paul is trying to, just, to just kind of undergird that and say, hey, get, get rid of that line of thinking When it comes to faith, people are counted as righteous, not because of their work, but because of their faith in God who forgives sinners. 
Abraham was counted as righteous. So what did Abraham discover? What did Abraham discover about right standing with God? He goes on to talk about in verse 9, it says, This is not a blessing only for the Jews, it's also a blessing for the Gentiles. We have been saying that Abraham was counted as righteous because, by God because of his faith, but how did this happen? Was he counted as righteous after, only after he was circumcised, or was it before he was circumcised? Clearly, God accepted Abraham before he was circumcised. Now, I'm not going to get into this whole story, but basically, Abraham believed God before God said, hey, you should be circumcised. That's a whole different topic for another day. But what Paul was trying to illustrate to his Jewish audience was that, hey, Abraham was credited as righteous before he went through this thing that you call, have a ceremony for being set apart for God. He said, you, there's something here. It's happening before. And so then he goes on to say, clearly God's promise in verse 13, clearly God's promise to give the whole earth to Abraham and his descendants was based not on his obedience to God's law or the rules, right, but on right relationship with God that comes by faith. And then as an aside, Paul says, if God's promise is only for those that obey the law, then faith is not necessary and the promise is pointless. We know that to be true, right? If we live our whole life in, the cl- in, in this model where we say we have to abide by all the rules, and if we don't abide by all the rules, then we're going to be asked to leave. We're going to be kicked out of the relationship. If it all has to do with what we earn and how we, how we perform, then, then, then faith is pointless. That's what Paul is saying. For the law always brings punishment on those who try to obey it. The only way to avoid breaking law is to have no law to break, Paul says. So the promise, in verse 16, is received by faith. It is given as a free gift. And we are all certain to receive it, whether or not we live according to the law of Moses. If we have faith like Abraham, for Abraham is the father of all who believe. That's why the cheese ball song of, you know, Father Abraham had many sons exists right there. I'm one of them and so are you. Right hand, left hand, let's praise the Lord. All right. Long before the Ten Commandments were given to Moses, Abraham was given the label righteous. Not because of anything he had done. He was a sinner just like everybody else. But because he believed God. The cool thing is 2,000 years later, Paul would make this kind of connection between Abraham's act of faith and those seeking right standing with God. So in the very end of chapter 4 in verse 22, it says, because of Abraham's faith, God counted him as righteous. And when God counted him as righteous, it wasn't just for Abraham's benefit. It was recorded for our benefit too, assuring us that God will also count us as righteous if we believe in him, the one who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. He's saying it wasn't just about Abraham, it was about you. He was handed over to die because of our sins and he was raised to life, get this, to make us right with God. What's Paul's point? Paul's point is the righteousness available to Abraham is available to you as well. The means by which you attain a right standing with God is the, uh, is the same as Abraham's. Faith. You have this all-access pass to have a relationship with God if you have faith, if you believe like Abraham believed God even when it was difficult to, even when it didn't make any kind of earthly sense. God granting something as important as righteousness or some, on such a simple terms is hard to believe. It's, that's, and it's understandable for it to be hard to believe because relationally speaking, it's unprecedented. It's unprecedented. Maintaining a good standing with people requires that we behave a certain way. Other than our mamas, virtually no one extends that kind of unconditional acceptance. Right? So is it possible that God would do such a thing? 
I think so. God was simply saying, trust me. He said it to Abraham. He said it to Moses. He said it over and over and over again throughout Scripture. And he says it to you and he says it to me. Will you trust me? Ernest Hemingway said that the best way to find out if you can trust somebody is to trust them. Rick Warren said this about trust. He said, trust in God completely means having faith that he knows what is best for your life. You expect him to keep his promises, help you with problems, and do the impossible when necessary. God's saying, do you trust me? Will you trust me? Not do I believe and then behave or whatever, but will you trust me? And Paul kind of expounds on this internal struggle because trust is an internal exercise and it's an internal struggle. Abraham had it. We, we, we know my, by no means do we want to sit there and paint Abraham in this. He just kind of blindly did nothing. He had internal stru- struggle and Paul expounds on that. In verse 18 it says, even when there was no reason for hope, Abraham kept hoping, believing that he would become the father of many nations. In other words, right? Like, even when there was no reason to believe, even when there was no reason to hope, Abraham had to choose to keep hoping. Even when you don't see any way out of your current situation, even when you don't see the light at the end of the tunnel, even when you are kind of in a a place where you're going, how am I going to get out of this? One of the biggest and strongest and most powerful things that we can do is just to continue to believe Continue to have hope in him. For God said to him, that's how many descendants you will have. Remember the stars in the sky. And Abraham's faith did not weaken, even though at about 100 years of age, he figured his body was as good as dead. Amen. And so was Sarah's womb. Abraham never wavered in believing God's promise. In fact, his faith grew stronger. And in this, he brought glory to God. He was fully convinced that God is able to do whatever he promises. And because of Abraham's faith, God counted him as righteous. Sometimes we got to be reminded, our, and we got to remind ourselves, am I fully convinced that God is able to do whatever he promises? When we find that time of struggle, when we find that time of wrestling between hope and belief, when we find that, that time where we're going, I'm not really sure how this is going to happen, are we going to come to a, be a place where we are convinced that God is able to do whatever he promises and really just trust him? Abraham believed God. He trusted him. And God proved himself faithful. God declared his relationship with the nation of Israel before telling them what he required. God gave them Israel rules because they belonged to him. They were, he was their God, and they were his people. The Ten Commandments were confirmation of, not condition of, Israel's relationship with God. And after proving himself trustworthy to that nation, God asked the nation to trust him in return. God did not give Israel rules as a means to establish the relationship. God adopted the family model. The people of Israel were his children, and he became their father. He was their father. It was a different model. God loved Abraham. God loved Israel. It's not presumptuous to assume that God feels the same way about you. You have that access to him. It's recorded for our benefit because God will also count you as righteous if you believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. That's how you're made right with God. The purpose, God's ultimate purpose in choosing Abraham always included all the nations of the earth. His plan includes you. So we should not be just surprised to discover that when Jesus appears 1,500 years later after Abraham, he would extend God's offer of salvation beyond the borders of Israel. Now one of Jesus' followers, John, Jesus' closest followers, he says, he stated Jesus' intent 
this way in John chapter 1. He said, Chil- he said in John chapter 1, verse 12, But to all who believed him and accepted him, he gave the right to become children of God. Not members of the club, sons and daughters. Those of you who are thinking like, I'm just trying to figure out, is this, is this for me? Maybe in the past you've been hurt by church. Maybe in the past you've been hurt by rules versus relationship. What Paul was really trying to tell the Roman church at this point in time was, hey, everyone has access to this. And guess what? We have more in common than what sets us apart. In fact, Abraham is a shared commonality that we all have. And he was on to say, this is for all of our benefit because we are all made right with God if we believe him as Abraham believed him. So if you are seeking God, if you are returning to God, if you are exploring faith, all you have to do is to make that choice to say, you know what? Am I going to trust him and believe him or not? For those of us who, who, who follow Jesus, the, the reminder for us is to be fully convinced when everything around us says otherwise. To be fully convinced that God is able and willing to, to keep his promises. Okay? So this morning, the challenge for us is to understand that we have access to God. That God is, is able to do whatever he promises and we, all we have to do is come to him and say, God, I'm yours. Let me pray with you this morning. Father, we thank you so much that this is recorded. It's preserved that Paul wrote these words to a, a Roman gathering of Christ followers. And reminded all of us, not only at that point in time, but those of us in this room that are watching right now online, can remind all of us that what you did thousands of years ago was for our benefit. That we have an understanding that relationship preceded any rules. That God, you adopted us into your family. You want us to be part of your family. And all we have to do is say yes to you. All we have to do to have that access to having right standing with you, God, is to believe in you. To believe that you sent Jesus who died for our sins and made us have right standing with you. And God, this morning, whether or we've, been, we, we, we've been a follower of you for a while or to maybe today is a, a coming back moment saying, hey, I want to follow Jesus. I pray that we will all be reminded of how wide, how deep, how long, how great your love is for us. That you did all these things so that we can have a relationship with you. That we can be your children and you will be our father. We love you, God.